good morning. Uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to meet together. Uh, Lord, it's uh, my prayer that this morning uh, you would speak to us from your word. Uh, help us to understand clearly what you uh, have for us this morning. Uh, even more than that, help us to understand the importance of doing what we know, of doing what you have taught us in your word. Lord, we think also of the many uh, brothers and sisters around the world who uh, are under heavy persecution right now uh, simply because they choose to claim your name. Uh, Lord, the burden is, is hard for them. We pray that you would strengthen them. We pray that you would encourage them. Lord, help them to know that they are not alone. Help them to know that you are right there with them. Help them to know that uh, we know about them. We are praying for them. We are lobbying for them. We are doing uh, all that we can to help them. Ultimately, though, Lord, uh, they are in your hands and help them to realize that. Uh, for there's no greater comfort than knowing that you are in control of everything, even when things don't look the way we'd like them to. We can trust that you are a good God, that you are in control, and you know exactly what you're doing. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to 1 Samuel 15. That's where we're going to be spending time this morning. And uh, as you're turning there, I ran across the story of a, uh, a notoriously ruthless businessman uh, who happened to know Mark Twain. And they were talking uh, together at one time, and the businessman said, uh, Mark, before I die, I'm going to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, like many people want to do. And I'm going to climb to the top of Mount Sinai, and I'm going to read aloud the Ten Commandments. And Twain, of course, always quick-witted, said, I have a better idea. You could stay home in Boston and keep them. <laughs> of course, underscoring the reality that, you know, what good does reading them do if you, if you don't keep them? Uh, that's exactly uh, what we're going to be studying this morning in 1 Samuel 15. Uh, so starting there in verse 1, uh, we read this. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So you'll see that this story actually starts back in Exodus. Let me read just a few verses from Exodus. Uh, in Exodus chapter 17, uh, starting in verse 8, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. <clears throat> I'm sure you remember the story. Uh, the Israelites have just been ransomed. They've just been rescued uh, by God out of Egypt uh, from under slavery. And now they are, they are journeying, journeying up towards the promised land. The Amalekites, however, don't like them for whatever reason and come out and attack them. And so Moses then goes up on the mountain. And you'll remember that Aaron and Hur go up there with him. And as long as uh, Moses has his, his arms up in the air, the Israelites are winning. When he lets them down, then the Amalekites start winning. And so Aaron holds up one of his hands, Hur holds up the other hand, and eventually the Israelites prevail uh, with Moses' hands held up high. <clears throat> However, uh, this doesn't make God very happy, uh, right? He, he, he's sort of thinking, you know, these are, these are the people I just saved, and now you're out to get them right away. Um, so as a result, in Exodus 17, uh, verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Okay, so all the way back in Exodus 17, several hundred years before our passage at hand, uh, God says, God says, 
what the Amalekites did was wrong, uh, in addition to all of the other sinful things they've done, and I'm writing their name down to be wiped out. So fast forward then to 1 Samuel 15, when Saul is king of Israel, and God comes to Saul through Samuel, and he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you now to wipe out the Amalekites, just like I said back in Exodus 17. We have this phrase here in, the, in verse 3, uh, go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction. <clears throat> this word uh, occurs uh, several times, actually, in the Old Testament, and it, it may be translated as ban, put them under the ban, uh, or, or something to that effect in your translation. <clears throat> but the idea is when you're devoting someone or some people to destruction in this context, you're giving them to God for judgment. Okay, so it's, it's very similar. If you think back to Genesis 6, where we have the flood, remember there is so much sin in the world that God says, I've had enough, and he wipes everyone out, except for one family. It's very similar what's going on here with the Amalekites, or if you look back in Deuteronomy 7, there's about seven different nations that are mentioned specifically as being under this ban. They are specifically devoted to God for destruction. And these uh, seven nations, uh, plus or minus a few, are under uh, somewhat of a curse, I guess. Uh, God has said, I've had enough of these people. They've persisted in their sin, in their rebellion, in their disobedience for long enough. It's time to wipe them out. In Genesis 6, he did that with a flood, but most normally, God does that using other people, using more normal means. And so that's exactly what's happening here in 1 Samuel 15. God is using the Israelites then to completely wipe out the Amalekites. However, we should keep in mind a few things about this, because when we, when we read these sorts of things, our tendency is to want to question the justice of God, right? want to question how could, how could he really do that? One thing to keep in mind is uh, verse 6, what we have here in 1 Samuel 15, 6. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So an important thing to remember is not everyone, not everyone that the Israelites fought against fell under this ban. Okay? It was just select people, um, select people groups. Uh, so that's important to remember. In this, in this particular case, the Kenites were living among the Am Amalekites, and God, through Saul, made provision for them. You guys should leave, otherwise you, you will be destroyed. But as long as you leave now, uh, you'll be okay, you'll be safe. So it's not something that applies to, to everyone. It only applies to specific people groups. Secondly, God is the one who decides who is under this ban. Right? It's not man. Uh, if you put one man or one nation against another man against another nation and they try to do this, we would all rightly say that's wrong. That's genocide and that ought not to happen. But, and this leads us into the third point, we are all guilty before God and it's only by his grace and mercy that we take our next breath. So when you pit man or a nation against God, no one has anything that they can hold up against him. No one can say, you haven't treated me fairly. Because the reality is we have all turned away from God, and we are all deserving of death. So God decides who is under this, and God then also determines the means by which this happens. Uh, so is it just? Is it loving? Is it right for God to do this? Without a question. It is within his purview. It is within his authority he created the entire world, the entire universe, right? Most of which we don't even know about. It is within his uh, purview to do this. So, God says to Saul, very clearly, very simply, actually, I want you to destroy all of the Amalekites. So let's read what happens then. Uh, in verse 7, 1 Samuel 15, 7, And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah, uh, let's see, Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. 
All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Interesting, right? Uh, the narrative makes it clear that Saul did most of what he was commanded, but obviously not all of what he commanded. Uh, Saul did not obey. But what we should see, what we should take note of, is any Israelite um, in this battle, any other man uh, in the ancient Near East from the culture would have said, Saul is a great king. Saul has done wonderfully. Right? He took his nation out on a conquest, completely defeated the other nation. He kept only the king, which is more of a, of a gloating sort of a thing, because uh, now he can say, I have a servant who's a king. Right? That's a, sort of a, a boastful thing to do, is to keep the king. And then what did they keep? They kept the spoil. Right? They kept all of the good, all of the goods uh, from the nation that they killed. So this is, by all accounts, in the ancient Near East, Saul was a great king except for one account, and that was the only account that mattered, God. He said, devote all of them to destruction, right? Leave none of them behind. That's not what happened. Verse 9 here, actually, uh, the, the last part there, it says, all that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Uh, it reminds me of the story, which I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard, but I'll go ahead and repeat it anyway. Uh, there was a woman who was cleaning out her deep freeze, and she got to the bottom of it, and there was a, a turkey, frozen solid in there, and she thought, well, I haven't bought a turkey in a long time. So she looked at the date, found out it's 28 years old. It's like, wow, you know, this has been in there for a long time. So naturally she thought, I wonder if it's still good, right? I mean, it's been frozen solid. So she calls up Butterball Support and is talking to the representative and says, I have this turkey that's been in my deep freeze for 28 years. Is it safe to eat? He said, well, I've never been asked that question. Hold on, let me go. Let me go talk to somebody else. He gets back on the phone and he says, well, are you sure it's been frozen the whole time? You know, it hasn't thawed and gone back. And she said, oh, yeah, it's been in my deep freeze. Uh, he said, well, in that case, it should be safe to eat, but we can't really guarantee the quality at all. It's, uh, it's probably going to be pretty bland. It's probably lost all of its flavor. So the woman paused and, and she said, well, that's okay. I'll just give it to the church. <laughs> yes, uh, that's exactly what Saul and the Israelites have done, right? What does it say? All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Another way to say that, they devoted to God. That's ridiculous, right? And yet, unfortunately, before we criticize them too harshly, uh, we do the same thing, right? Right? I mean, almost every day, I think we can find areas where we do this. How often do we really give God the best part of our mind? You know, we all uh, operate a little bit differently throughout the day. Some of us have the most clarity in the morning. Some of us have the most clarity at night. Maybe it's the afternoon. Well, I think most people, maybe not the afternoon. But um, how often do we give God the best part of our mind? How often do we give him the best part of our emotions even? Or do we waste them on movies? Of course, it almost goes without saying, how often do we give God the best part, the first part of our money? Or do we show up on church on Sunday and say, oh yeah, well, we'll rifle through our wallet. I guess I have five or 10 bucks I can drop in the plate. These things are not pleasing to God. It's not pleasing when we give him the least of what we have. I, I, picture, I picture myself at the end of history as we know it, standing before God, the one God, the one king over the entire universe, and rifling through my wallet saying, oh, well, here's, here's five or ten dollars. Right? Whatever I give is going to be of no account. But at the very least, when I stand before my king, I want to give him the best. Right? I think we, we all want that. More often than not, though, we take the tact of Saul and the Israelites. I'll keep the best for myself, and whatever I don't want, I'll donate to the church. Proverbs 3.9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. Unfortunately, 
I suspect that if there were a short commentary on American life and culture in the 20th and 21st century, it would have to be something to the effect of, we kept the best for ourselves. We kept the best for ourselves. Most people would have no problem with that, actually. Of course, I, I mean, I worked for this. I worked for what I have. Of course I'm going to keep it for myself, right? Many of us probably think the same thing. And yet, faced with a world that is in complete disrepair, it's a very sad commentary that we keep the best for ourselves. So what happens? Back in 1 Samuel 15, uh, what happens to Saul and the Israelites? I'm going to continue reading here in verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel said to Saul, and, I'm sorry, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. So Saul has no problem recounting what happened, and with a brazen face says, I have kept the commandment of the Lord. Right? But let's, let's talk a little bit about what we see in verse 11 there. Um, if you're reading in the ESV with me, you'll have uh, the word regret, right? God says, I regret that I have made Saul king. And at the end of the chapter in verse 35, uh, we also read, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. But we need to compare that with what Samuel says actually in verse 29, still all in 1 Samuel 15. Samuel says this, and also the glory of Israel, so God, will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Okay, so if you're confused, so am I. Or so was I. The word is the same in the Hebrew, in all these cases, the word for regret. Uh, but just like in English, the, the same word can have different meanings depending on the context, right? And so thankfully, actually, in this one passage, we have uh, at least two different meanings of regret, helping to clarify what it means when God has regret. And essentially, what we see in verse 11 and in verse 35, when it says the Lord regretted that he made Saul king, is sorrow. That's what he's talking about. God is sorrowful that he made Saul king, and the sorrow is due to the fact that Saul is disobedient. Right? The, the, the man that he anointed as his king has now chosen to turn away and not do what he was asked. And so that causes him sorrow. But what Samuel says here in verse 29 is also true. Uh, and in fact, the NIV translates it a little bit differently. Verse 29 reads like this in the NIV. It does not lie or change his mind. And see, that's sort of a, another aspect of regret where we say, I'm sorry I did that. I wish I could go back and change it. And that's what the Bible is saying. That's not what God says. He says the first part, I'm sorry about that. It has grieved me that this man has not done what I've asked. But he doesn't continue like we do and say, I wish I could go back and change it. So the distinction there is really in our understanding of, the, of that word regret. And I just want to clarify that God is not saying, I wish I could go back and do it over again, right? I mean, he knows everything to begin with. Uh, but he is saying, it grieves me when my children don't do what I tell them to, right? And that's the point. We see further here in this um, short little passage, uh, let's see, in verse 12, uh, it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, what did he do? Uh, he set up a monument for himself. How interesting, right? Uh, he sets up a monument, and then later he blames the people for keeping some of the spoil. 
right? So, of course, Saul is blameless and innocent, just like Aaron. Remember when the Israelites make the golden calf? Aaron says, well, I just threw the gold in the fire and out popped this calf. Uh, <laughs> Aaron and Saul are doing the same thing. They're shirking their responsibility and are trying to maintain their innocence when it's simply not the case. It gets worse, though, because what Saul and the people are trying to do is offer to God what has already been devoted to God. It's, it's like the imagery of, uh, let's say after the, after the message is over, you go back in the office and you search through the offering to find the biggest check. And you say, well, this is, this is quite a check. I'm going to go cash it, but then I'll give it back to God. It doesn't work like that, right? It's God's. It's already God's. You can't take it out and give it back. That's exactly what the Israelites are doing here. Everything, all of the Amalekites are devoted to God for judgment. They can't then take some of it and try to offer it to God as if they're doing something new, as if they're doing something that will just please God's heart and make him happy. <clears throat> so that leads us into what Samuel says, and that is the sermon. We've, we've sort of gone over the story so far. We're going to talk about the sermon, not my sermon, but Samuel's sermon, what Samuel says to uh, Saul and to the Israelites. And then we'll talk about the sentence. So the sermon here, uh, it begins really when, when Samuel starts talking again in verse 16. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And let me just clarify that real quick. Samuel's not accusing Saul of being humble. It kind of sounds like that. What he's accusing him of is doing the same thing that we do quite often. It goes kind of like this. Well, I'm not the pastor, so it's not that big a deal if I go and do this. Or I'm not up on stage every week, so it's just fine if I go ahead and do this. You see, he's, he's degrading himself in order to rationalize his behavior. It's, I, I would hesitate even to call it false humility because really all he's doing is turning on his mind and saying, how can I make this seem more reasonable? How can I make this seem right enough that I can do it without having a guilty conscience? So that's what's going on in Saul's mind. Uh, so Samuel says, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission uh, which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best things <clears throat> devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. So the question before us, the question before God, really, in 1 Samuel 15 was, will my king obey me? Will the king of Israel, whom I've anointed, will he do what I ask? If not then it follows that the nation probably won't. You take any organization and the same rule applies. If the leader is not willing to abide by the rules, if the leader is not willing to follow what God has said, the rest of the organization will follow suit very soon. In Deuteronomy 17, God gives three qualifications, three requirements for the king of Israel. One is to not be militaristic. One is to not be an internationalist. Don't make treaties with a bunch of other nations. The third one is to love the Lord. Let me read a little bit. Deuteronomy 17, starting in verse 18. 
And when he, that is the king, sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it, read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and all these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left hand, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. The most important of the three uh, requirements of a king of Israel, Saul is clearly not meeting. Right? We already read he went and patted himself on the back by setting up a monument up on Carmel. Later we read in verse 30, then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people. He's concerned, of course, about his image. There's no question that he has not done one of the three simple things God requires of the king. There's no way that Saul has copied the book of the law, right? The first five books of the Old Testament. There's, he clearly doesn't have them with, them with him. He's clearly not reading them. He's clearly not obeying what God has required. Obedience is what it comes down to. Obedience is so important that later in the Old Testament, in Amos 5, we read this. God says, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. These are things that God has told Israel to practice. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. What God wants from his people is obedience, right? He doesn't need them to pretend like they have something else to offer to him. And if the lives of God's people are not demonstrating that they love him, that they will follow him, their worship becomes noise. Their worship becomes useless. If anything, it's working against them. We have this word in verse 23. Uh, we have, re for rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Now this word presumption uh, is the only place that this occurs in the whole Old Testament. So we have one occurrence of this word, and what that means usually is we don't have a really good idea of what it means. Uh, however, if you've been in our Psalms class, you know a little bit about parallelism, and this is indeed poetry, verses 22 and 23 is poetry, Samuel speaking, um, and the word presumption here is parallel to the word rebellion. Right, so at some level, it has something to do with rebellion. So there's a lot of different translations um, that people have tried. A presumption is what the ESV uses. The NIV says arrogance. Uh, the New King James, I believe, says stubbornness. Uh, they all sort of get at the issue of, of not doing uh, what they've been told to do. The reason why I like the ESVs is because I think it starts to point us in the direction of, of why they were disobedient. Right, Saul, I mean, clearly Saul was disobedient. But why was he disobedient? Basically, because he presumed to know better than God. He presumed that offering sacrifices of the spoil would be better than just doing what God said in the first place and killing everything. Right, offering sacrifices is a good thing. Uh, the, the law talks about it several times that they ought to do that. But not when God says, kill everything. So presumption then makes Saul, or us when we do it, into our own gods, right? We think we know better than God. This is actually built in to uh, pretty much every religious system. Uh, Catholic thinking goes something like this. I'll go do whatever I want and I'll just go to confession. No big deal. Protestant thinking, if you think we're any better, we say free grace. Everything I ever have done wrong, everything I ever will do wrong, is forgiven. So I'll just go do whatever I want. Pagan thinking, 
I'm not accountable to any, anyone, so I can do whatever I want. Secular thinking is not too far off. As long as my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, I'll be okay. The reality is all of these systems illustrate our complete aversion to submitting to the authority of God. That's our goal, is to be able to do whatever we want. We don't want to have to answer to God. When we do 99% of what God asks, we don't want to be accountable for that 1% we didn't do. It's presumptuous to think, God will forgive me anyways, so I'll go ahead and sin. And yet all too often, that's the thinking that goes on in our minds. The question when we stand before God, because ultimately we all are under the authority of God, it won't be, Saul, how many sacrifices did you offer to me? It won't be, Paul, how many churches did you plant? It won't be, Mary Jane and Joe, how many times did you go to church? It won't be, did you help the guy who was broken down on the street? Right? It, it's, it's all much simpler than that. It will be, did you obey me? Did you obey what I said? And I'll give you a hint. The answer is no, but I trust Jesus Christ who did it all. I trust Jesus Christ who paid it all. But Jesus himself says something in John chapter 14, verse 15. It's very short. I recommend you memorize it. If you love me, you will do my commandments. If you love me, you will do my commandments. You can't earn your way into heaven. You can't earn your salvation. This has nothing to do with salvation. The issue is, you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, and now he says, if you love me, if you truly do love me, you will do what I say. James puts it this way in James uh, chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 22. If you want to flip over there, you're welcome to. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Did you catch that? Deceiving yourselves. If all you do is go to church each week and hear the word, you're deceiving yourself. What you're actually doing is you are raising the bar of responsibility because now you know everything you ought to be doing and you're not doing it. That's much worse than someone who knows nothing about what they're supposed to be doing and is not doing it. You are responsible. Verse 23, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. He won't be blessed in his hearing, or in his thinking, or in his seeing, or in his understanding. He will be blessed in his doing. Obedience is what matters. Many of you are familiar, I think, with A.W. Tozer. Uh, he put it like this. He said, No man is better for knowing that God so loved the world of men that he gave his only begotten Son to die for their, trans for their redemption. In hell, there are millions of people who know that. Theological truth is useless until it is obeyed. The purpose behind all doctrine is to secure moral action. The reality is, in America today, this is the situation we find ourselves in. The problem, I suspect, with almost every last one of us in here is not that we are ignorant of what God has said. That is a legitimate problem around the world, but not here this morning. We know what the Bible says. The problem is we still choose to disobey. We still choose to not do what has been so clearly revealed. So what then is the sentence? We've gone over the story in 1 Samuel 15. We've talked about the sermon. Obedience is what matters. What's the sentence that befalls Saul? Verse 
starting in the second half of verse 23. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Saul's sentence was, that's the end of you being my king. Friends, when we act presumptuously, there's another word for it. Foolish. It's foolish to act presumptuously for several reasons, one of which stands out among all the other ones. Actions have consequences. Actions have consequences. They used to be the basis of our educational system. Now you'll be lucky to find that anywhere. But the reality is, actions have consequences. There's an, there's an adage that I'm sure you've heard. Perhaps, like me, you've even repeated it. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, right? How foolish that is. How foolish that is. Perhaps it's easier to ask, but it completely ignores the fact that <clears throat> actions, have ac actions have consequences that in most cases are completely irreversible. You cannot undo what has been done. And forgiveness does not entail restoration of position. We muddy this all the time in our thinking. We think that if I've been forgiven, then I should be given back everything I had prior to my sin. That's not the way it works. Saul may well have been forgiven here. The kingdom is no longer his, period. Ananias and Sapphira, if you recall from the scripture reading, they thought it would be a good idea to sell their field, give the proceeds to the church, but of course they lied about it. They said, we're giving everything, when in reality they weren't giving all of it. Actions have consequences. That was the last act they did. Will they be in heaven? Probably, right? One act does not determine where you go. Whether or not you trust in Jesus determines where you go. But actions have consequences. If you think of it this way, imagine there was a nursery worker doing inappropriate things with our children. Now, Lord willing, they admit it. We find out about it. You, obviously, the first thing is they'll be removed from the nursery, right? But assuming that they are repentant, I hope that we would allow them to remain in our congregation. But raise your hand if you want to put them in the nursery again. I don't think so. Actions have consequences. Forgiveness does not remove the consequences. Obedience is what matters. Obedience is what lasts. Many of you, in conclusion, are familiar with Stonewall Jackson, right? The, uh, one of the generals of the Confederate Army during the time of the Civil War. He was a very bright uh, military strategist, won a lot of battles. Um, but there's this story about him. Uh, he was called in to the commandant's office to have a meeting with him, and he went in, uh, met the commandant, and the commandant said, wait here in the foyer, I need to attend to some other things. Uh, he went and attended to some other things, completely forgot that Jackson was in the foyer, and went home. He went out the back of the building, went home, had a nice evening, came in the next morning, walked in the foyer, and to his astonishment, Jackson was sitting there in the exact same chair. He was flabbergasted, right? He couldn't believe he was still there. And Jackson provided this as an explanation. He said, it never occurred to me to leave the spot of duty where my superior told me to stay. It never occurred to me to leave the spot of duty where my superior told me to stay. What faithfulness, what obedience. Oh, that we would have the same amount of obedience, the same amount of faithfulness when it looks foolish, when it looks stupid, 
to do what God has said, when we're ridiculed by the world, by our friends, by our family, even by those in our very own church, perhaps, oh, that we would have that sort of obedience that says, it never occurred to me to leave where God has placed me. It never occurred to me to not do what God has commanded. Jesus' words are essential for us to ingrain into our minds. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of your word, uh, your written word, the work that you have wrought in your son, Jesus Christ, is phenomenal. We confess that we are unworthy. We confess that we have not obeyed what you have commanded us. And we do indeed cast ourselves upon your grace and your mercy in your son, Jesus Christ. But Lord, we also want to commit ourselves to you, knowing that what you have said is, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Give us the strength, give us the power, help us by your spirit to do what you have told us. And when it's all over, may we say we are still yet unworthy slaves. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.